So we're on site here at Renmark, right next to the Murray River. Now I'm standing in front of some pretty decent sized uh, cables. Uh, these are 500 mil aluminium uh, flex. So effectively, I'll just walk through here. You're talking about a fair degree of flexibility with a 500 mil cable. Now, I'll just take the cap off here and you can see the flexibility, you can see the strands here. Now, these rolls have been cut, have been pre-cut before we receive them. So it varies in lengths of uh, 30 meters up to 60 meters. Now let's get down to the specs of this particular project. What we're talking about is a 11 kV feed, as you can see. And it is being connected to two transformers. The first one being a 1500 kVA transformer. And the second one, slightly smaller, at 1000 kVA. Obviously, correct signage for this area, demarcation. And over here is the main switchboard, and as you can probably see, 11 kVA, so there's a signage there that matches with the actual feed from the HV. Now, as we come around, now the interesting thing about this site, it's incredibly close to the Murray. We're talking probably about 10 metres. Um, now, obviously the Murray does flood, but this is a pumping station, so they've got all that covered. Otherwise, they wouldn't have built it in this area. Now, as we come around the side, we can see the cable tray, okay, coming up. So sweeping over that uh, galvanized pipe structure. We can see the earthing point here, tray coming over, all the feeds coming through here into the um, main switchboard area. Now, this is the switchboard room here. And with most switchboard rooms, it's air conditioned. Now, up in Renmark, you're talking about extreme temperatures from um, pipes freezing in the middle of winter to 44, 45 degrees. So keeping the switchboard room at the right temperature is incredibly important. Hence, they have two fairly decent size um, air conditioners that are uh, servicing this, this switchboard area. Let's walk this way. And we'll walk into the switchboard room. So you're talking about the main high voltage circuit breakers in this area. Irrigation pump unit number one, number two, three, four, five and six. And as you can see down here, some old style analog dials. For instance, here is an overcurrent earth fault relay. So pretty robust gear. So this is a switchboard over here. So this is the MPS switchboard. And the MEN link is behind in here. Very important, you see these signs, you stay well away. You do not touch, you do not honor. This has been locked out. That's the bus bar zone above here. Now over here is the uh, VSDs. So these are variable speed drive pumps, that's number six and all the, uh, the associated equipment required. And this is the automatic control center, has a by bypass valve control. So what we're talking about is a lot of equipment in this room. Now, we're trying to tie into this system the following. Two 500 kVA inverters. Each of, that, each of those 500 kVA inverters has been tied in to one megawatt hour of battery storage. And they all parallel together. Come this way.
To my right is the Grid Safe Secondary Protection Board. Now this is a board that Greenwood manufacture that we use on all our own jobs and obviously we send these around Australia. So effectively the system is as follows. 11 kVA feed onto two pad mount transformers. Transformers feeding to the main switchboard room. The main switchboard connecting to the grid safe. Then the grid safe connects to the inverters. Now let's have a look over here. We're talking about um, some fairly big cable here. So we got the, um, the actives, red, white, and blue. We've got 150 mil earth. We've got a neutral. This is, again, this is the 500 mil squared aluminium flex. Incredibly hard to manhandle. This cable is going on a, a flat run, a straight run, to 150 mil conduit, 30 meters. That's a lot of cable in 150 mil. Well, it's actually not that much, but considering we had to hand pull this, it was pretty considerable. So you can see, if you look in the actual pit, you're talking about a few conduits there. You've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, at the moment, you can see like a collar. Now, these collars are used over the larger conduit, so when you're actually pulling the cable, you're not putting undue friction on the inside of the actual conduit itself. So these collars are sort of sacrificial. And what happens after a bit of time, you, tend, you, you rotate them around, so you're not always wearing on that one point. You might wear that point there. So for instance, here, if I go right into the pit, bear with me. Oh, you might, okay, I can't really move at the moment, but you're wearing, say there, then you rotate this around, and then the wear point will be over here, because you don't want to be continuously pulling in one spot, because eventually you're going to wear through this. So they're, they're sort of sacrificial, but they should last quite a bit of time. You probably can hear an echo on the microphone because I'm down in the pit. So effectively what happened, we had to, we trenched all the way through here, all the way along under the road. This particular trench was excavated. In some cases when there's a lot of services, they tend to use a high pressure water jet to actually create create the, uh, the trench, uh, and that's in situations when there's so many services that you just can't use an excavator, and digging by hand is not an option. So imagine we've got these cables, these um, four by 500 mil aluminium cables with a 150 mil earth coming all the way through, over to effectively the inverter battery station. You're talking about 150 mil slab. It's been crack tested because the batteries weigh a considerable amount, uh, let alone the inverters. You've got, it looks like 100 mil gal pipe and this is gonna be used to um, support a chain link fence, which will probably be, by the look of it, three meters high. Now, here's the other end of the cable. And what Michael's done is taped it all up and connected this rope when we pulled it through. And um, he used a series of half hitches. So it's clinching. So basically you're clinching along one, two, three, four, five, and six points. So distributing the, 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 the stress um, of the pull across a few different points. You don't just tie the cable on one, one point and expect it to uh, be pulled through. If you do that, the, uh, the rope could break and come off and it'd be nothing worse than the cable coming halfway through the trench and <laughs> the rope breaking, that would be absolutely terrible. So the same configuration over here. Um, now, so since yesterday, the guys have um, Dyna bolted in this roller. So the cables had to come out of this 150 mil conduit. We had to vertically pull it out, pull enough so it, and then individually feed these 500 mil cables through their uh, requisite 
conduits. Um, we have to pull obviously all these cables in one go on that straight run because of cable burn. But in, on this really short run, run, doing this 90 degree bend, we can put them in individually. But they're still hard. I mean, this is thick cable. If it was um, copper, <laughs> yeah, you, you, you wouldn't be able to do it probably um, weight wise. Obviously, um, aluminium is lighter than copper. It doesn't have the same current carrying capacity per millimeter squared, but it does have a greater current ca capacity per weight. It's an interesting one, but um, aluminium is considerably lighter. As I said before, this aluminium is pretty damn flexible. Um, there's stranded aluminium that has less um, Less flexibility obviously has a larger uh, bending radius. Now, there are other methods of actually uh, pulling cable through apart from by hand, as I mentioned before, a cable puller. But in this situation, it, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't feasible at this point in time. Now, in regards to the rollers, obviously they reduce the, the stress and tension Actually, they don't reduce the tension, they reduce the stress and the friction on the cable. There are some internal um, systems where you can put inside the conduit, uh, quad rollers, double rollers, uh, which would probably make the job a little bit easier, but we didn't have those. Now, we're, we're here at one of the inverters. This whole inverter here is 500 kVA. And it, as I said, it couples up with uh, one megawatt hour of battery storage. And there's the unwrapped battery storage system. Oh, that's one. And this is one of them over here as well. So effectively what happens, each one of these is 250 kilowatt hours. Now, right here is the other 500 kVA inverter on a custom made pallet that would have taken a while to put together. You're talking about a combined one megawatt inverter with two megawatt hours of storage. Remember, megawatt, kilowatt hours is, um, is actually storage, it's not power. Whereas the, when I talk 500 kVA or 1000 kVA, one MVA, that is power that's instantaneous. Um, storage has a time component so don't confuse those because a lot of people do now the right here the guys have been running um, 300 mil uh, tray for the feed the the DC feed to the batteries so in this tray you're actually mixing a little bit of tiny bit of AC but mostly DC and this is to this AC here is to power up the uh, the supply of the, uh, in the actual battery unit, um, the air conditioning and various other componentry, components that require um, um, 230, 230 volt. So we, what we're talking about here is fairly high voltage with DC. You're talking about, according to the spec sheet, uh, 998.4 nominal. Now, for those of you who have done off-grid um, and maybe on-grid battery storage systems with some of the I'll say traditional voltages of 24, 48, and say 120 volts. Uh, the cabling is substantially thicker than what we're using here. So we're using we're using 95 mil, um, even though the uh, the voltage is fairly high, but the current is also considerable as well because we are talking about all in all uh, one uh, megawatt hour of storage per inverter. Um, so two megawatt hours complete. You can see the cabling coming out of the inverters here and this, um, this section that's been punched out obviously is being uh, protected along here so there's no cable rub rubbing against the gal. This is the battery. One thing that, to notice here is that we have this chain. Obviously it's protected with its sheath and it's, um, it's designed around the arc flash of this particular cabinet or the potential. So effectively, the, the, um, the door can only open a certain way. Now with these, these battery systems, they also have a uh, fire suppression system. Usually they um, use a powdered glass 
which has proved to be the most effective way to pull out uh, any electrical fires when you're looking at lithium ion phosphate batteries. You can see the main, main switch right here and you can see the individual, um, I'll call them cassettes, they're a fairly large cassette. Now cattle have been making batteries for a long time, I believe they're the biggest um, battery manufacturer in, in China, so they're very quite well known. You got your warning lights here, you got the HV light, you got the LV light here, and then you got a little bit of a data sheet. And here's the actual um, specs here. 140 amps on the DC. So the short circuit on this is 12.2 kiloamp. But obviously what happens with um, any protective devices, they have these ratings, it's all time based. Now, you, you may have experienced in, in a domestic situation where you're running like two kettles off one GPO and you're going, hang on a sec, how come they're still running when you've exceeded the current? And that's because the breakers have these ratings based on a time uh, consideration as well as the actual current as well. So it'd be the same, obviously, with a battery sy system. Now, these are pretty considerable um, sized units and they'd weigh a fair whack. So you can see the Evo Power sticker. Now they use a Delta inverter, so obviously Evo Power have a relationship with Delta. Delta have been making inverters for a fair amount of time. So you can see here the max DC voltage on this is 1,120 volts DC. Now interesting, they've got a PPE requirement, category two. So the DC short current uh, rating on this is 48 KA. Obviously it's 400 volt VAC, nominal, three phase, and the rated AC current is 750 amps. So that's just some specs that you'll see on all inverters. So effectively with this particular concrete pad, the, the real estate is arranged in such a way as we have the uh, inverter number one placed here, inverter number two placed here, back to back. Now the spacing is up to the, is, is determined by the manufacturer, so manufacturer's requirements, but also those other considerations down the track. So if you haven't had much experience with these jobs, it's very easy to bugger up and go, oh, we'll just go to the manufacturer's recommendations, but hang on a sec, what do we have to get a, what if we have to get a forklift in to move this unit out? What do we have to, what if we have to get a crane in? Now, if you come down this way, all of these actual battery units will be placed back here. So it's a simple configuration. You've got inverter number one, best system number one, inverter number two, and best system number two. So that was the site. So we're not halfway through, probably two thirds of the way through. So can't wait to show you the finished project. See you next time.